SpaceX received a $2.9 billion contract from NASA in April 2021 to develop a lunar variant of its Starship rocket as the human landing system for Artemis III, the mission that will return humans to the moon. In recent months, however, the company has faced criticism from NASA officials, including acting administrator Sean Duffy, for delays in developing the HLS version of Starship. Now, if SpaceX had the contract for Artemis III, the problem is they're behind. They pushed their timelines out and we're in a race against China. The president and I want to get to the moon in this uh, president's term. Former NASA chiefs Charlie Bolden and Jim Bridenstine also voiced doubts about whether the current Starship-based architecture can enable a lunar landing before China's first crewed mission. Architecture is as such. We need to launch Starship. That first Starship is a fueling depot that's in orbit around the Earth. Then we need to launch, nobody really knows, nobody knows, but it could be up to dozens of additional Starships to refuel the first Starship. So imagine launching Starship over and 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 over, dozens of times, no delays, no explosions, to refuel the first Starship. Then once it's fully refueled, then that Starship has to fuel another Starship that is in fact human rated, which that process hasn't even started yet. By the way, that whole in space refueling thing has never been tested either. We're talking about cryogenic liquid oxygen, cryogenic liquid methane being transferred in space, never been done before, and we're gonna do it dozens of times, and then we're gonna have a human rated starship that is refueled that goes all the way to the moon. Now when it goes to the moon, we don't know how long it can be there because it's boiling off the entire time it's in orbit around the moon. We don't know how long it can be there. But while it's there, we have to launch the SLS, we have to launch the Orion, the European service module, we have to have astronauts and crew all ready to go. And they have to, they have to orbit the moon themselves and then they have to dock around the moon, they have to transfer from the Orion into the Starship, it has to go down and land. When it's on the surface of the moon, Starship is gone, or uh, Orion is gone for the next seven days until it comes back around in near rectilinear halo orbit. So our astronauts are right now planning to be on the surface of the moon for a period of seven days without any way home. This is an architecture that no NASA administrator that I'm aware of would have selected had they had the choice. But it was a decision that was made in the absence of a NASA administrator in the last administration. These concerns have prompted NASA to consider reopening the lunar lander competition, potentially expanding contracts to include Blue Origin's Blue Moon Lander, which is already slated for Artemis V. So I'm gonna open up uh, the, the contract. I'm gonna let other, uh, other uh, space companies compete with SpaceX, like, le, le, like Blue Origin. In response, SpaceX addressed Bridenstine's remarks through a series of posts on X, backed by supporting evidence. The company acknowledged his past leadership at NASA, but noted that he now operates a lobbying firm representing several aerospace contractors competing for NASA funding. The company said his recent criticism of Starship's progress stems from that role, not from an impartial technical assessment. SpaceX emphasized that Starship was originally selected during Bridenstine's own tenure at NASA through a fair and open competition. NASA's internal evaluation team, appointed under his administration, identified Starship as the best and lowest risk technical option and the lowest price by a wide margin. The company added that this decision was later upheld, even after protests and legal challenges from competitors delayed the contract's start. SpaceX argued that Bridenstine's current push for new lander contracts misrepresents his role, describing him as a paid lobbyist, advocating for firms that are years late and billions of dollars over budget. Along with these clarifications, SpaceX published a detailed progress report addressing broader concerns about the Starship HLS program. The company emphasized that its current Starship design remains the most capable and scalable path towards sustainable lunar exploration. It confirmed the completion of 49 major milestones under its HLS contract and noted that it is now assessing a simplified mission architecture designed to enable a faster and safer lunar return. Let's dive into those key developments achieved so far. The Starship HLS variant features a pressurized volume exceeding 600 cubic meters, roughly two-thirds the habitable space of the International Space Station. It includes dual airlocks of about 13 cubic meters each, enabling multiple astronauts to conduct simultaneous surface operations. The interior layout supports extended duration missions with full life support systems, crew accommodations, and workspaces. 
Cargo variants are designed to deliver up to 100 metric tons of payload directly to the lunar surface, including rovers, modular habitats, and power systems for long-term infrastructure. Since the first integrated Starship flight in April 2023, SpaceX has advanced its next-generation launch system through a rapid iterative test campaign. Each mission has expanded the vehicle's flight envelope, providing critical data to refine systems that will directly support Artemis operations. The same architecture powering the lunar variant is being validated through these full-scale orbital tests, ensuring reliability in ascent, in-space maneuvering, and recovery. Among the most significant achievements, SpaceX successfully transferred five metric tons of cryogenic propellant between tanks in orbit, a crucial milestone for the large-scale orbital refueling that will enable Starship to reach the moon. The company has also demonstrated in-space restarts of its Raptor engines, essential for precise translunar injection and descent burns required for lunar missions. Recent flights also tested radio frequency sensors that measure propellant levels in microgravity providing critical data on how fuel behaves and how it can be precisely monitored during long-duration missions. Parallel to the development of the core Starship system, SpaceX's Human Landing System team has been advancing the lunar variant through an extensive test campaign. SpaceX has built a full-scale Starship HLS cabin module designed to serve as a fully functional platform for astronaut training and integrated system testing ahead of lunar missions. The cabin incorporates operational avionics, crew interfaces, environmental control and life support systems, thermal regulation, and communications hardware, mirroring the configuration planned for actual lunar flights. During testing, multiple participants occupied the cabin, while engineers validated oxygen and nitrogen injection, air circulation, humidity management, and temperature control. The campaign also measured acoustic levels to confirm a safe and comfortable environment for long-duration missions. In collaboration with Axiom Space, the company also tested the crew elevator and airlock using pressurized EVA suits, successfully demonstrating crew and cargo transfer between the Starship cabin and a simulated lunar surface. To prepare for docking operations in lunar orbit, SpaceX successfully qualified its androgynous docking adapter, designed to connect Starship with NASA's Orion spacecraft. The adapter builds on Dragon 2's proven flight hardware and can function in either an active or passive configuration, providing compatibility and redundancy during critical mission phases. Landing systems underwent similarly rigorous testing. A full-scale landing leg assembly was drop-tested at flight-level impact energies onto simulated lunar regolith to verify structural integrity and study how the foot pads interact with the surface during touchdown. Complementing this, a dedicated Raptor engine throttle test demonstrated the fine thrust control required for soft lunar landings in reduced gravity. To simulate extended coast phases in space, engineers performed cold start demonstrations with both sea level and vacuum optimized Raptor engines that had been pre-chilled before ignition. These tests confirmed reliable restart performance after long exposure to cryogenic conditions, an essential requirement for translunar flight. Engineers test-fired 14-inch 3D-printed hybrid rocket motors several times to study how lander exhaust plumes interact with the moon's surface. The tests reveal how rocket blasts disturb lunar regolith, create craters, and eject dust at high speeds, providing data to refine models and make future Artemis landings safer and more predictable. SpaceX also conducted micrometeoroid and orbital debris testing to evaluate different shielding and insulation materials. Results confirmed that the selected material stackups can withstand both hypervelocity impacts and harsh thermal conditions. Navigation and landing accuracy were validated through demonstrations of Starship sensors, radar, and guidance software, systems that autonomously identify and steer the vehicle to a safe, precise landing site on the moon. In parallel, the company completed a comprehensive software architecture review, mapping out all major control systems and defining functions for fault detection, caution and warning logic, telemetry management, and command processing. Other tests focused on operational systems. SpaceX validated the power generation and distribution unit for Starship's propellant depot variant, confirming consistent power flow during orbital storage and propellant transfer. RF communication trials verified reliable two-way links between ground stations and vehicle-mounted systems using flight-grade hardware. Engineers further demonstrated Starship's onboard medical system, confirming functionality of diagnostic equipment and establishing telemedicine capability for continuous communication between the crew and mission control. 
Finally, SpaceX activated a hardware-in-the-loop testbed for the upcoming orbital propellant transfer demonstration. The setup incorporates flight representative components to simulate real-time operations, allowing engineers to test propellant flow, valve sequencing, and system behavior under realistic mission conditions. SpaceX and NASA jointly reviewed the Integrated Lunar Mission Operations Plan, defining flight rules, crew procedures, and coordination protocols for the first lunar flights. Together, these efforts have advanced the Starship HLS from conceptual design to a mature, test-verified system ready for integrated flight demonstrations. Each milestone not only validates a critical subsystem, but also strengthens the overall mission architecture that will return astronauts to the lunar surface in the coming years. To date, SpaceX has built more than three dozen Starship vehicles and produced over 600 Raptor engines. The Raptor 2 has accumulated over 226,000 seconds of test time, while the newer Raptor 3 has surpassed 40,000 seconds across multiple campaigns, evidence of the system's growing maturity. The combined fleet of vehicles and engines, together with Starship's network of five launch pads under development across Texas and Florida, forms the backbone of future Artemis missions. Looking ahead, SpaceX's next milestones will focus on validating the upgraded Starship V3 architecture, optimized for higher performance, reliability, and reusability. Upcoming missions will include a long-duration orbital flight to assess thermal stability and propulsion endurance, along with a full-scale in-orbit propellant transfer demo planned for 2026. Together, these tests will confirm Starship's readiness for sustained cryogenic operations and multi-week spaceflight marking the final steps toward operational lunar missions under NASA's Artemis program. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. Japan's space agency, JAXA, has successfully launched its most advanced cargo spacecraft, HTV-X, on its debut mission to the International Space Station. The launch took place on October 26th from the Tanegashima Space Center, aboard Japan's newest and most powerful launch vehicle, the H-3 rocket. The mission, officially designated HTV-X1, proceeded flawlessly, from liftoff to stage separation and fairing jettison, with all sequences executed as planned. About 14 minutes after launch, the cargo ship separated from the upper stage, deployed its solar arrays, and began a four-day autonomous journey to the ISS. Developed by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, HTV-X succeeds the long-serving H2 transfer vehicle series that supported the ISS for over a decade. Measuring 8 meters long and 4.4 meters in diameter, it can carry up to 6 metric tons of cargo, roughly one and a half times the capacity of its predecessor. The spacecraft's modular architecture includes three main sections, a pressurized logistics module for crew supplies and experiments, an unpressurized cargo module for external payloads, and a service module containing avionics, propulsion, and power systems. For navigation and maneuvering, HTVX uses a ring of reaction control thrusters to manage attitude and perform precise orbital adjustments during approach and departure. Its advanced autonomous guidance system enables accurate phasing and docking operations while maintaining strict safety margins around the station. On its maiden voyage, HTVX-1 delivered a diverse manifest, including crew supplies, life support equipment, maintenance tools, scientific instruments, and technology demonstrations. It also carried six CubeSats for deployment, supporting missions in Earth observation, environmental monitoring, ionospheric studies, biodiversity tracking, and communications technology. Notable payloads include Mount Fuji, an externally mounted laser reflector for validating satellite laser ranging in low Earth orbit with sub-centimeter precision, providing cross-verification for the spacecraft's attitude data. Another payload, Delight, deploys a one-square-meter X-band phased array antenna on a carbon fiber truss, demonstrating lightweight, high-efficiency communications architectures for future solar power satellite systems. Upon arrival on October 29th, the spacecraft was captured by the ISS's Canadarm2 robotic arm, operated by astronauts aboard the station, and berthed to the Harmony module's nadir port. The crew will unload supplies, install experiments, and later refill the vehicle with waste and discarded materials. After several weeks of stay, HTVX will undock from the station in January, perform a series of separation and phasing burns to lower its orbit, and then execute a controlled deorbit maneuver. The spacecraft will re-enter Earth's atmosphere and disintegrate over the South Pacific, ensuring complete burn-up and safe disposal of station waste without contamination risk. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. 
If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.